Hey y'all, Ron here from Military Images Magazine with a new episode of Life on the Civil War Research Trail. Yesterday, I shared the story of a Confederate officer photograph that turned up at the Baltimore Antique Arms Show, my meeting with Tina and the great conversation we had. And uh, I also said that it was one of the true highlights, the highlight of my visit during the weekend at the show. Well, I want to talk today about another highlight. This time, I want to talk about a Union image, and you can see it right here. This came out of the show, and it's unusual. It's, it's what I would call a tableau, which is to say an image, a still life, where you have a reenactment of some drama, some situation that occurred at some point in history. This is very popular. It's a very popular way to communicate and to leave behind a visual record. And so this example, of course, is particularly interesting because we have a soldier, what appears to be a Union soldier. He has a ragged coat and pants on. The uniform coat is very obviously missing a sleeve. He's wearing his cap, which is tilted a little jauntily to the side. Uh, you can see his trousers are all ripped up, exposing his legs. He's barefoot. In front of him is a, uh, a small campfire with tiny little sticks. There's a tin cup that's beneath it. I can imagine that he wants us to picture him cooking some crude meal of whatever little bit of food that he was receiving. There can be no question he's a prisoner of war because the sign above this makeshift shelter that's apparently keeping the rays of the sun off of him has the words Andersonville as it is. One of the important words in this phrase is is. It doesn't say Andersonville as it was, it's Andersonville as it is, which leads me to believe that this image was taken during the war itself while Andersonville was still occupied by Union prisoners of war and managed by Confederates in charge of the prison. Reinforcing that idea is the format of the image itself. It's a carte de visite, that baseball card size photograph that was imported from France at the eve of the beginning of the uh, the eve of the Civil War. And um, I say that because the size, if I was to show you a card to visit you right now, it's about that size of a modern trading card. And we can also see the double gold borders around the edge of the mount, which was popular during the Civil War period. On the back of the photograph is an imprint of the photographer's name, which is in New Jersey. Now, that's also a valuable clue, and I'll get to that in a little bit. But first, I want to talk about the tent or the shelter uh, that surrounds the soldier. It looks like it is made up of a couple of maybe a raincoat or some waterproof type device. You can see some buttonholes. It may have been a poncho of some sort. Uh, and I'm not sure if it was actually um, there at Andersonville. I tend to think not because it looks clean and fresh and new, much as the tin cup. Uh, so don't, we don't really know the origins of this. But what I can tell you is according to the National Park Service, who did an examination of prisoner diaries and memoirs, there's seven common types of shelters that were built at Andersonville during the time of its occupation. The first one is tent flies made by attaching two blankets to a ridge pole. So pretty much a standard tent with the center line being made of uh, rope. The second one, crude lean-tos made by piecing together strips of cloth onto a pole frame. It's pretty self-explanatory. The third kind is what caught my attention, a kind of teepee made by draping a blanket over a short vertical pole. And that's exactly what we have here. 
It's not a, it, it's, if it's a blanket, it's a poncho blanket draped over a crude pole that's in the inside. You can see a little bit of it inside the shelter. So that is an important moment of understanding here because we now know that it fits into a narrative of the different kinds of shelters. I suspect this, uh, this numbering system from one through seven um, suggest they're least or most popular to least popular because number four is holes dug vertically into the ground. Number five is holes that were dug down and sideways to create small caves. Number six are adobe-like structures made with mud bricks and seven are huts made of split pine boards. So I want you to imagine the landscape of Andersonville. I'm sure you've seen pictures and history books Imagine these seven different types of shelters across the landscape of Andersonville underneath that sun or cloudiness, depending upon the season and the weather. Uh, you can imagine how that might have looked. An artist and prisoner of war, Robert Knox Sneeden, it's a name that may be known to you. He was there and he described the shelters in this way. He said, some had dug holes in the ground three or four deep and made a slanting roof over them of poles and pine top boughs. The whole camp looked like a collection of pig pens. So it leads me to wonder, this man that's pictured here in the ragged clothing, was he one of the survivors of Andersonville? And then when you think about the back mark, the New Jersey photographer's imprint, was he perhaps a New Jersey soldier who was imprisoned in Andersonville and one of the fortunate ones who survived and got an early release from prison and then made his way back to New Jersey where he posed for this image? It's possible, but we have no name, no inscription. Uh, I also ran his image through Civil War Photo Sleuth, which I've talked about before on this show, CivilWarPhotoSleuth.com. Use this face recognition technology to help identify soldiers and sailors. Couldn't find a match there. So he's currently lost in time. I hope someday that his identity surfaces. Assuming that he has some connection to New Jersey, it reminded me of uh, some research that I had done in the past where I found that 235 New Jersey soldiers were reported to have died at the camp, the hundreds that were there. In 1899, a monument was erected on the grounds to honor those who were lost. On that monument is a verse inspired by the Go Tell the Spartans Memorial at Thermopylae. I want to read this verse, which has been co-opted, and a New Jersey theme has been introduced. Here's that passage. Go, stranger, to New Jersey. Tell her that we lie here in fulfillment of her mandate and our pledge to maintain the proud name of our state unsullied and place it high on the scroll of honor among the states of this great nation. Was this soldier pictured here or there? Did he know some of those 235 Jersey men who perished and who became the subject of this verse from Go Tell the Spartans. Again, we don't know, but I hope that someday we can find out. Until the next time, we'll see you on the trail.